Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you. Um, just to introduce myself, I do recognise quite a few of you, um, but in case you don't know who I am, my name's Emma and I'm curate at Christchurch Litchfield and St James the Great in London. And also I am the Deputy Environmental Officer for Litchfield Diocese as well. So I've kind of got a curate's hat on and my environmental hat on quite often. Um, but I'm here today to talk about the fifth mark of mission uh, which is something that I'm very passionate about. The environment is something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, so the fifth mark of mission is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Now, I'm not keen on the fact that, um, that they're in order, you know, that there's five marks of mission and this is the last one. Uh, number one, because it puts a lot of pressure on me coming last when everybody, when you've had, you know, the bishop and all these other people that have come along and spoken, and then I, I have the, uh, the, the task of speaking last, which I think is always more pressure. Um, but also it makes it sound like that this mark of mission um, isn't as quite as important as the other ones. Um, and, you know, that's always a problem when you've got a numbering system, isn't it, that the last one seems to be the least important. Um, so it would have been, I always think it'd be nice if they'd done it as like a spider diagram or something like that, where it, you know, it wasn't obvious which one was which. Um, this fifth mark of mission was actually added later on. So originally there were four and then a fifth one was added for the environment. Um, so, you know, it does show that the environment has become more and more important. I think it was added a couple of years after the main uh, marks for mission. Um, so it does, does show that the environment is important. It's something that we do need to be looking into. Another thing I'm not keen, keen is the wording, the, the wording to strive, because for me that means um, to try, but also there's probably an expectation that we might not quite make it. Um, and, you know, you don't have to strive to nurture and um, find new believers. You know, you just have to nurture and baptize new believers, for example. Um, so, you know, I, I always think there's a bit um, in there as well that, you know, we just need to safeguard. We don't need to try. We need to, you know, we need to be getting on with it and, and doing what we can for the environment. And then the sustain and renew bit for me really is talking about that balance that we need to create. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a bit um, about the community of, of creation and how actually that balance nowadays with climate change probably isn't there as it should be. Um, so we'll, we'll look into that. So I've picked Job 38 and Psalm 104 for us to look at today. Um, so I've kind of thrown in a bit of a curveball. I haven't gone for all the Genesis ones, um, probably because some of you may have already heard me talk about things like that at different deanery events and things like that. And I wanted to highlight that there is other areas in the Bible that do talk about creation and the importance of uh, creation and what we should be doing about it. So that's why I've picked these two instead. But yeah, I've not, you know, I could have picked stuff like love your neighbor or even things like, um, you know, the birds of the air and the lilies of the field and how God uh, cares for those. And so we don't need to be worried about being cared for. I could have picked stuff like that. Um, could have picked all of the creation stories in Genesis. Um, but I just thought that there are, there's a lot more that uh, is out there to highlight the fifth mark of mission. Um, so that's why I picked these ones. But I wanted to first of all start by asking a bit of a, a question. Uh, and we'll come back to this question a bit later on. Um, but I think it's important for us to think about this. Um, so the question is, who, who was the world created for? Who was the world created for? Any, any, anybody want to pipe in at this stage with who they feel the world is created for? I know it's a very big, deep question to ask at this time in the morning when we're probably only all on our second cup of coffee. We're not well, completely it up yet. Sorry? I think it's yeah. important to say that the world was created for everything, not just human beings. Yes. It was created for all creation. Yeah. Yeah, I think we do focus quite a lot on humanity, don't we? And yeah. that we feel it's just created for us. And I don't... Because without, that without that. everything else, we wouldn't exist. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Ted, okay. are you going to say something? Um, okay. Well, I was just going to say that, of course, that wasn't the view when much of the Bible was written. 
And I think that then becomes a problem for us um, because that was also a Christian view for a long time and still is a view of lots of evangelical Christians, for instance, in America. So in a way, the book that we turn to is, although it has some inspirational passages, is a lot of it is written at a time when when there was a belief that the earth was we well the business that that um i think in genesis you know that all the animals were there for us to rule over and i think this is one of the problems christians have with um, um with environmental issues mm -hmm. yep i agree completely so we'll be we'll be looking at that in a little bit more detail as we go through this anybody's got any other suggestions can i waffle on a bit on the big picture yeah. It always seemed to me that creation must have a purpose beyond the world. Whatever that purpose might be, God created something, not just so ultimately we could all be in heaven with him, but for some bigger purpose. And the natural creation, the human creation together are actually part of that bigger purpose whatever it might be. I mean, it, it's hidden to us, uh, but it's, it's, it's there for something that is beyond us more than we can understand. And it is not simply there for now, I would suggest. It's there for something into the future. And there I'd look at Paul's the whole creation is straining just to see um, the children of God come into their own, you know, uh, so that's, so I, I think I'd look at it that way. And I, I have given that bits of thought but um i find it helpful to hold on to that bigger picture angie's wants to say something i always feel that we need to include the whole universe in creation anyway so that's not just created for man mm -hmm. stephen i'd want to say something about creation, the universe being there uh, to sh share in the life of God as a kind of um, overflow of the life of God, um, which exists for the glory of God. That would be my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think I think we I, I think I agree with all of those comments. They all kind of come together, don't they? That, you know, we do think about humanity probably first. And there is a lot in our kind of history of church and how we've understood God and how we've understood our scriptures in the past. Um, but also there's something much bigger going on there. It's not just about us, it's about other creatures, it's about the whole earth, and it's also about the universe as well. Uh, so we, we you know we, when we're talking about creation and striving um to safeguard that you know what are we talking about you know so that's why i kind of wanted to bring that question up first um so that we can kind of you know it's not just humanity it's it's everything that we're trying to strive to to safeguard um so yeah we'll just hold on to that thought and then we'll we'll go into the bible studies and then we'll come back to it again because i think we might get a little bit more from that once once we've looked at the um the passages that we're looking at today so we'll have a look at the job one now we've got a little bit of background about job because i realize i'm kind of going in at the very end of the story and some of you might not have looked at job for quite a while it's one of those ones that you know you tend you know we i remember looking at it in you know sunday school but i don't think i really studied it all that much until getting to theological college to be honest um so i thought i'd just go through a little bit of the background um, so at the very beginning of Job, Job is described as this blameless and upright man. Um, he's got seven sons and three daughters. He's got 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen and 500 donkey um, and very many servants, it says. Um, so he was described as the greatest of all people in the East. So he was obviously quite a powerful person. You don't get to have that many sheep and you know livestock and all of that without being a powerful person in the area he would have had a huge amount of land i mean to have that many sheep and animals in that time would have meant that he would have had miles and miles of land um, so he would have had a huge amount of wealth 
Um, and I do often wonder, you know, how how did he get to be the greatest? You know, was the profiteering off of the people? You know, I mean, it does it does say that he's a, a blameless and upright man, um, but it does make me think. Well, how did he get to have so many sheep and so many cattle, so many of this? Um, so I'm always a bit. Hmm. Um, and it doesn't seem the most sustainable way of living. You know, he's got all this wealth, all of this livestock and everything. How is that shared out amongst his community? Um, you know, he's got very many servants. I would say that, my, you know, th those would have been slaves. Some of them would have been slaves. Um, so, you know, how, how is that shared out across the community? You know, so I think, we, you know, there are some questions about Job straight away. Uh, but, you know, so Job seems to have this perfect life. He's, you know, he's managed to have a fruitful life. He's got all these sheep and everything. He's got a good family around him. Uh, but then disaster strikes. Um, some of his family are killed in like a hurricane where, and, a, and a building uh, falls down on top of his family. And then there are other parts of his family at the same time who are uh, robbed of their belongings and they're killed by these robbers. Um, some of his sheep are burnt by like a lightning storm. Um, and then other robbers make off with his other livestock. So all of a sudden, Job's world falls apart um, and he is afflicted with sores all over his body. Um, so he's obviously suffering uh, mentally and physically as well. Um, I think most of us nowadays would say, well, you know, that is a really, really bad year, obviously, for Job. And you can understand why everything has happened you know, we can't understand why stuff has happened to him, but we can understand maybe some of his reactions afterwards uh, because of the, the year that he's had. So Job, Job falls into despair and he's really angry with God. And I think most of us can probably understand that when, you know, when stuff goes wrong to that extent, I can understand why somebody would be angry with God. And, and Job basically thinks that he deserves better because he's he's great he's very a very pious man he's righteous man and so he feels that he deserves better from god really but you know god's giving him a bit of a rough time for no reason and job really does feel kind of abandoned by god and then he's got these three friends around him who try to help him you know they try to cajole him and say well you know how about this and you know we can help you and and all of that but really they fail in their in their task and they just don't know what to say to him and Job basically moans and pretty much moans for 37 chapters of Job there's a whole load of moaning but I mean you can kind of understand it he's had a very rough time um but he basically moans and he says that he wants to die and that he curses God for failing him but then this other man stands up called Elihu and he stands up for, for God, really, and says, well, hang on a minute. You've said all these things, but actually God is still great. You know, God is still this and that. And how about this? And how about that? So he kind of comes up with this defense, as to, you know, why God is so great, even though all of these things have happened to Job and he's in a, a time of despair and, you know, he's really suffering. That still doesn't mean that God isn't great. And then all of a sudden the Lord speaks to Job. Uh, it, we get to Job 38 and he speaks to him. Now, would somebody like to, if they've got it in front of them, would somebody like to read it out for us, please? The, 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 Job, the bit of Job 38 that's on the sheet. Ruth, please. Then the, <clears throat> then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that dark, darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall you, your proud waves be stopped. Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt 
to bring rain on a land where no one lives, on the desert, which is empty of human life, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, and to make the ground put forth grass. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? God, God continues, um, he talks for the whole of, I mean, I've, I've picked this specific verses here, but Job 38 is full of this. And then it goes on into 39 and 41, and it talks about all these different types of animals that God is caring for and, and looking after. Um, and it talks about like wild ox and trees and eagles and hawks, stars and mountains, and even the Leviathan, which is like the sea monster, and how God even cares for the sea monster, you know, which I think is quite an amazing thing to think about, isn't it? We think of this like horrible monster, um, you know, of myths and legends, um, that that God is caring for that as well. It's not just all the nice little fluffy bunnies and stuff like that. God is looking after all of it. So I think really what, what impression of God do you get from, from that passage from Job 38? I think something that struck me as I was reading it was that only God knows what's behind the universe, um, why things were made as they were made, um, why things are as they are. Um, that was the first thing. And the other thing was about the end when it's talking about can you hunt for the lion? for the lions and feed their young? Can you do these things? Um, that every animal has its its it, it skills, if you like, and its ability to, to look after its own. Um, and I think that's something that perhaps we, as humans, in an arrogant way, have often thought we're the only ones really that can do skillful things. But actually, you look at any part of creation and it's, it's incredibly skillful. Um, Thank you, yes. David? From a literary point of view, Job is, a, is, a, is presented sometimes as a response to the, the problem of suffering, um, as if it was a problem uh, suggesting as a solution. And th the whole book of Job doesn't do that at all. Uh, it sets out the fact of suffering at great length, as you say, and then God speaks, and God doesn't answer the problem. He just described he says you ask all these rhetorical questions and the answer is always well you you did these things you created these things and in the end there's there's no answer but the response of the, of the, the man who's given these questions is silence in the end there's nothing to be said so it gives a huge context a universal context in which these things happen but if you're looking for the answer here it is it, it doesn't work like that at all it's it's it faces this huge mystery and says god is a mystery um and then in the end the, the book of job attacks on this little and the all it happily ever after which seems very strange really uh as if prosperity there's the level in which the problem is prosperity you have prosperity you lose prosperity but in the last few verses, it's all right because you get the money and even the children back. Um, and it's very problematic. And, and really, it leaves you with the mystery of the immenseness of God. And is it who are you to answer? Who are you asking? Who, who, who are you to question me? So it's, 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 it leaves you with more things to ponder on than the answer. Mm -hmm. 
Are you still muted? Do you think part of the um, impact of this kind of passage is, is to generate wonder? Yeah. Yeah. A sense of wonder, which provides then a, a big, big context in which to see one's own life, including one's suffering. That, that's just really a footnote to what David has said. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a big reminder that we are not in control, isn't it? That, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter how much we think we are in control, we really are not, you know, and I think Job it almost kind of throws his toys out of the pram, doesn't he? That, you know, I'm having a really bad time and God, you're not doing anything about it. And God really does kind of put him in his place you know, and kind of say, hang on a minute, how about the rest of the world? It's not just about you. How about the whole of creation? This is what, you know, as Ruth was saying, this is, there's a much bigger purpose than just you, Job, you know. Um, so I do feel that it, it's a reminder to all of us that, you know, we can't control creation. We can't control when it rains or when the sun shines and you know, you can't control it. it's so cold at the moment that none of none of our veggies have grown in our veggie patches, that kind of thing. You know, it's out of our control, isn't it? Um, and I think that's important for us to remember that. Anything else? That, yes, go on, sorry. Um, a, a, a couple of things come to me. I mean, the sorry, the trivial one, first of all, is I remember at some point in the evolution of the lectionary, Job always used to happen in August when we were on holiday with the children, which is probably the only time we ever did sort of serious Bible reading between us. And year on year, it was Job, Job, Job. <laughs> it was uh, dreary. Um, the other thing that I'm reminded of, and when I did my PhD a long, long time ago, uh, I rather pious, it was all about fluid mechanics, uh, water and wind. And I rather piously at the end use that phrase from Job, thus far you shall come and no farther and hear your proud waves be stopped. I mean, it seemed to me at the time, maybe overly pious, that when you've done all you can, you're still nowhere near in terms of knowing God. So that's still at the front cover of my PhD thesis somewhere, in some library, somewhere. <laughs> Was there anything that stood out for anybody else from, from this passage? There's, there's something about um, a quality of attention reflected here, isn't there? Uh, I mean, there's this huge catalogue of the natural world finally observed. Um, now, Job is wisdom literature and one of the aspects of wisdom literature is its, its attention to finding, seeking wisdom, seeking God and understanding God through attention to the created order. The sense that the created order tells us something about the creator. Uh, and and this, I think, works well within that kind of perspective, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a certain certain kind of wisdom that the reader is being invited to to um, imbibe, in a sense, and reflect on and see life in terms of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at first yeah. it does it oh. does appear oh. that Job is just getting a massive ticking off, isn't he, from yeah, God? Yeah, and, but actually, yeah, it's a huge best. celebration of creation as well. Mm -hmm. All this diversity. Um, but the line that always stands out for me is the one about, um, but you know, even God makes sure that it's raining where there is nothing. 
you know, that there's still rain regardless, you know, he's still looking after desert places as well as places that we see as being uh, fruitful, you know, and there is that tension, isn't there, between um, Job and being put in his place and, and that beautiful celebration. And I think there's always that tension in, in the creation story as to where, where's our part in all of this, you know, and where is God in all of this? Definitely. Yeah. Um, another aspect of Job and other parts of the Old Testament um, is simply the actual beauty of the language and the poetry. And many, many years ago, parts of the Old Testament, such as Job, uh, used to be set for A-level English literature. I mean, it doesn't happen now, but it, it did do, and that's another way of appreciating it. The beauty of the language and the poetry. It's um, a, um, a triumph of whoever wrote, wrote this. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and it was written down for a reason, you know, that it wasn't some, it's not like us, we might scribble something down as a kind of an afterthought, you know, because paper is everywhere to us and we, you know, we've got our computers and, you know, we can write whatever we want. Um, you know, the resources that they've got to be able to write stuff down wasn't very much, you know, so if they were writing something down, it was really, really important and they thought about it a lot and the, and the way that they structured things in their language was really important. So um, I, I agree completely, you know, that yeah. language is, is, is beautiful, isn't it? The way that it's mm. been written. It, it is almost like a poem, isn't it, Joe? Yeah. I think? Yeah. Very much Definitely. So. I mean, you know, you think we're, we think of um, Wordsworth or Shelley or somebody like that. We, we read that just for the beauty and the effect that it has upon us. You can do that with um, parts of the Old Testament, Job, the Psalms, lots of places. All the wisdom books, in fact, are beautiful the way they are written. Definitely. Anything else that anybody wanted to pick up on this Job passage? In that case, we'll move on to the next part. We'll, we'll discuss Psalm 104. Um, so again, I've just picked part of Psalm 104 because it is quite a long Psalm and I, you know, I didn't want us to be here till tea time tonight, uh, we've read all of it. Um, I've just picked the second part of it really. Um, but the first part does talk about how great God is because he's created the sun and the moon and the water and the mountains, trees, grass, cattle, all of that kind of stuff. So again, there's the whole kind of diversity of creation coming through there. Um, and it talks about all that amazing abundance that is life on earth. Uh, would somebody mind reading this out for me? Um, thank you, Mel. I love this psalm. There. Psalm 104, beginning at verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things, innumerable are there. Living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, 
praise the Lord. Thank you, Mel. So what stands out for you from, from this psalm? Um, it is one of my favourite psalms, I must admit. So I always love um, this psalm. And actually, um, it's one of the readings that you can use for Rogation Sunday. So it's literally just, just come up in the lectionary. Um, so it is, a, it is a beautiful psalm. Um, so what, what stands out for you from what we've read just? It, it's often used also at harvest time, isn't it, I think? Yes, it is. And yeah. uh, it does mention uh, food in, the, um, in that section that we've just heard. And yes, I think it's a beautiful psalm. Um, mm. I think a lot of the psalms are, are really good on the, the creation, aren't they, really? Yes, yeah. And it, it does mention the good times and the bad times together. When you open your hand, then it's a good time because we're filled with good things. But there's the other side, isn't there? When you hide your face, they are dismayed. They're in mm. trouble. There's a blunt honesty in the Psalms right the way yeah. through. Mm. Uh, there's no pretense yeah. that the world is... Everything is all good and yeah. Fine. Sorry, Mel, I'm jumping in. That's okay. Yeah, no, I, I was kind of going to say something on a similar thread. Really, it um, takes me back to thinking about you know, as we have done as um, a community in our church, thought about environmental issues from the um, sort of idea of creation and Genesis and our role within that um, and what place we have. And that idea, I remember us having a really interesting discussion in St. Michael's about the word dominion, uh, saying that we have dominion over creation and how actually that um, is translated in a certain way, but in the original doesn't necessarily mean that. And I think this, this, um, this Psalm really communicates to me the fact that we aren't supposed to have dominion over creation and over the world and what God has created. We, we are within it and God, God creates, God has created this. And as we've just said, that isn't always easy and sometimes it's difficult. And I love, I love it when um, Leviathan gets mentioned in Psalms as he was, as it was, she, it um leviathan was mentioned in job as well and it's that idea and i think leviathan and that idea of kind of sea monsters goes right to sort of really sort of early um psalms and the idea of how god created the world and and by doing so managed to control in a sense aspects like leviathan like this monster who um formed sport in it for the ships for the human beings that are trying to to, to, to travel the ocean um and that kind of re-emphasizes that idea that within creation there are difficulties for us that we can't overcome and we can't dominate and that's kind of the point of it um but yes i think that's just kind of going on from some of the things that have already been said, really. <coughs> Anything else that stood out for you in that psalm? I, I love the fact that the creeping things get a mention in this one as well. So we get that Leviathan thing, but we, you know, all the creepy crawlies get a mention, yeah. um, which, you know, you don't see all that often, do you? But no. actually there's a, there's a place for everything in, in creation. Um, my brother drives me mad with um, always asking about why wasps were created. Um. <laughs> That's one thing he always mentions. And I have to kind of say to him, well, you know, they do have their part. They might be really annoying to us, but actually, if wasps didn't exist, we would be overrun with other bugs. You know, they yeah. have a really important yeah. part in, in creation. Um, you know, so it, it's just highlighting, you know, those animals that we, that we detest and we don't like, you know, like spiders and wasps and snakes and rats and all of that. They all have their own part, don't they? Uh, and they're a precious part of the ecosystem. It, Absolutely. to create that balance in the world you know and I feel very much that in 
this psalm that they are all celebrated you know it's not just the good what we would class as a good animal you know but again that's us as humans creating that class isn't it as what we see as good or bad animals i mean there's that poem i think poem is a strong word for it i think by ogden nash gone in his wisdom made the fly and then forgot to tell us why (laughs) Um, i'm sure ruth will correct me if it's not ogden nash but i think it is (laughs) if it's not it ought to be yeah (laughs) yeah i I think the smallest um, i think sometimes you know the smallest we shouldn't think of things being more important than other things but the smallest things i think are as important as the large things in creation because without them we just things just wouldn't be able to carry on i'm thinking of all these billions of creatures that are in the soil that we we never really see you know doing mm-hmm. their job day after day turning yeah. the soil over making it yeah. fertile and so on David and then Ruth. Uh, a, a shout out for a local boy, Erasmus Darwin, so Charles's yes. grandfather, I think it was, he wrote about these microscopic creatures and the earthworm. And so there was this, was, as we found out more, and they go back to the, the microscope and we appreciated these things were there and gradually appreci- realised that we all belong together. So it's uh, a lot of these, these learned people who were perhaps partly clergymen as well, did teach us something perhaps and which has been been saying and again with wasps we had a the local wasp exterminator come around a few years ago because there's a wasp under our house and it was feel really bad because he really loved wasps and he he said well wasps are very important you know but his job is to go around and poison them but uh he had a he he had a mission to go around to people and say well don't you know perhaps you don't want them to sting your children but they're all part of it and so the more people who appreciate these things the people have learned about them studied them often they have this sense of uh, a whole network which we belong to yeah yeah i think what what came to mind when you were just talking about that and i'm afraid i'm going to be very vague here and somebody will tell me what it is but there's a um a science fiction which i don't normally read short story about a time machine and going back into the past and they're told they mustn't damage anything because it's oh changed. i know that one and one man yes. stands on a butterfly and they panic and they say no it won't make any difference and when they come back to the real world it's completely different it's all changed because yeah. that death of that one butterfly has changed things over the millennia um, yeah. and the whole world is different and i think that um obviously was a a story but it was a very powerful story um about how everything is part of a whole and if you damage one bit of it as we are seeing the results now with global warming and everything else um you know you can't say well this bit's more important than another Mm -hmm. because it's all part of a network and i think Mm -hmm. that's that's something that that comes over in both these passages I wonder if um, part of the intention of a psalm like this is to, as a kind of decentering, it takes us out of our cells and our focus on our cells uh, to see what's outside ourselves. Um, Mm. And I think morally and theologically, that's a very important dimension of a text like this. Uh, Because I I, I think our society can be very self-centered and centered on humanity. neglect to the neglect of the wider as it were ecology of life (laughs) and and so one of the things the text like this does to me is that kind of 
taking taking me out of myself, as it were. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, that then leads to the praise of God. Mm. Um, mm. I think there's very much a sense in this psalm that praise of God is for all of creation, isn't it? That you know we partake in that all together. It's not just humans, um, you know praising god but that the whole of creation does almost together in a in a balance uh, and I, I do agree with stephen about that kind of um you know that this kind of psalm doesn't center on us it, it centers on everything you know and the importance of that community coming together um the whole of creation coming together as a community to praise praise god um comes over i think in a lot in a lot more than perhaps some of the other you know genesis and stuff like that where i still think we probably focus very much on humanity's part in creation but i think this psalm brings out more that balance of all of creation i think perhaps oh yes go on ted i think perhaps because they were a rural society um they were more at one with nature than perhaps we have come we have become and and that is quite a quite a modern phenomenon really isn't it it's it's the industrial revolution and onwards that um we have lived a different life um but at the same time um i wonder if we would be that interested in the environment now if it didn't have it didn't look as though what we've done is going to have major effects on us so i think in a way what we're doing is excellent but um, I suspect it's still very much a selfish thing by humanity um, because we, whoops, <laughs> we may have got this wrong, right? We'd better put all our efforts to getting it right. So in a way, we're still being, we're still being very selfish, I think. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And, and obviously, the, probably the original writer of this psalm, whoever that may be, um, I'm sure they weren't writing this thinking about the effects of climate change and the environment and stuff like that. They were yeah. they were writing it as a, you know, as praise to God on behalf of all creation. You know, so they have got a diff. You know, we do come at it with a different experience. Um, and and very much, I still think we. You know, you hear a lot of environmental speak is all about well, we need to save this for the next generation and and things like that. So it is quite a selfish way of looking at creation definitely it's still self-centered isn't it rather than thinking about the balance for all of creation regardless of the environment you know environmental issues that we're facing today but as, as leslie said uh, th this covers the bad and the good this psalm mm -hmm. um and uh, you know that period around where are we uh around about verse 30 um indicates they knew all about about the bad side of the environment as well when and i'm sure when they had droughts and um and famine it must have must have really affected their, their whole way of life definitely yeah. yeah a lot more than it it probably does us today where you know we in some ways we can get around some of the issues um you know they they wouldn't have been able to get around some of the issues um of you know poor harvests and stuff like that obviously it still does affect us but probably not to the same manner as it would have affected them definitely i think i think us in that case is perhaps the first world um i think people still living that rural um life it it, it impinges on them much more and mm -hmm. so it's not just humanity doing this for itself it's to some extent the Western civilizations, if you like, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure if first world is is the in term these days, but anyway, I hope you know what I mean. It's so we're actually a very small part of us are really being, um, are really being um, very selfish. You know, how much do people really care if islands in the Maldives get swallowed up, unless they happen to have one of our favourite resorts on them? Um, so we we really do, even in in self humanity being selfish we've we've got to think of the whole of humanity and not just our bit of it mm -hmm. i, th I yeah, think it's important i think it's important to remember though that um a lot of nature is now going into the urban environment far more perhaps than it used to be so 
I think people in whatever part of this country certainly are aware of the um, of the creatures that are around us really you know I think that's is happening more now today perhaps than it did I don't know 20 30 40 years ago mm. in parts I think of London you know from the pandemic isn't it as well that we probably noticed nature a lot more yeah yes absolutely. because we're at home yeah. a lot more um yeah. I, I mean I would probably um push back slightly with that and say is it not the other way around are, are we encroaching on nature rather than you know parts of nature encroaching on us um you know yeah. with us taking yeah. up more and more land and for housing yes. and things like that mm -hmm. uh, and there are no easy answers to that because obviously we are seeing a population boom um so there aren't any well, easy yes, answers but, i mean it, it's always us that want more roads for example isn't it and it, it's irrespective of the damage that that is going to cause to the to nature in general um it, it's got to be what human beings want that's so vitally important in in my younger days i was an enormous fan of julie felix and um on the same lp you would find julie um uh um loving her chance to travel and to move around the world and then on the same lp you'd get a um uh, another song worrying about what we're doing to nature and it always <laughs> struck me that um in a yeah, way yeah. this very free-spirited young woman um summed up this this dilemma that we face yeah um you know she wanted to travel the world but she also realized that <laughs> we were despoiling it in doing it and, and you know when that 50 years ago i suspect i no, six, nearly 60 years ago i was following julie felix so, um you know it's been around for quite a long time go on ruth i think um it's interesting when we're thinking about you know us feeling that we're the most important bit and nature has to sort of make way for us or whatever i always <laughs> Probably shouldn't but when whenever we have heavy snow or something like that and you hear everybody going oh i can't get to work oh i can't do this and i think do you know it's very good for us to go actually we're not in charge of the world that actually the world can do things that we can't govern and that do make us stop and i just think sometimes we forget that bit um and sometimes things like heavy snow um does actually make people stop and go oh i can't live my life as I have been doing, even if it's only for a few days. And, and, but we don't think that enough, I don't think, that, that, that actually we're not in charge of the world. Uh, I think people tend to think that they are. So I think we'll move back on to the question, because it, it may be that you've, now we've thought about it a little bit more about who the world was created for. Mm -hmm. 